Hello and welcome to our course on optimizing your MRI parameters virtual console simulator. I'm your host, Tim Troncalli. I've uh, spent about four decades in medical imaging, three of those in MRI. Uh, most recently, I worked for GE Healthcare as an MR product specialist and advanced clinical leader. Also, I have taught uh, MRI physics and anatomy in vocational courses for the last 20 plus years. So welcome and let's get started. We've got a lot to get through on this. So we're gonna start out just by looking at some basics first. We're gonna look at MR contrast weighting, sequences, image quality, and then we'll get into some multi-slice acquisitions. In this first section, we'll look at contrast weighting. So we'll go through the basics. We'll be looking at adjusting the TE and the TR to create our contrast we call T1 and T2, and then the impact, the impact that has on, on signal. So in this first section, we'll look at which parameters control T1 weighting, which parameters control T2 weighting, list the weighting values and appearances of tissue on T1 and T2, the impact on signal on both T1 and T2, we'll different contrast parameters, TE and TR, and we'll also look at SNR, our signal to noise ratio. So just a little bit of review here, just to kind of remind us about how this uh, contrast is formed. We know the two things occur when radio frequency is applied to excite protons in uh, a magnetic field. Um, so two things happen. The tissues go through two rates of recovery. Uh, these happen simultaneously. The first one is called T1 relaxation, which is the rate of regrowth of magnetization back to the longitudinal plane. So along the magnetic field, and we have T2 relaxation, which is the shrinking of the magnetization in the transverse plane where our coils are. Reviewing the parameters, TE is the time between the RF excitation pulse, which is the 90 degree pulse here, and the midpoint of our echo, our signal that's received. And so you can see the TE right here from the 90, which starts the sequence or excitation pulse to the midpoint of the echo. And the TR is the time to, between the start of the pulse sequence with the 90 degree excitation pulse, all the way over to the start of the next pulse sequence with this next 90 excitation. And so things happen within that TR period, such as rephasing and refocusing. Uh, and we'll discuss that. Our contrast weighting, of course, is based on the values that we input on the system for T1 and T2. Looking at some parameters here on our decay curves, on starting with the T2 effect, as we'll see in a little bit, T2 actually occurs first. Once the magnetization has um, been excited and moves into the transverse plane, it begins to decay, and we have what, uh, what's known as T2 relaxation. So if we use a short TE and take our snapshot here, uh, we have minimal T2 effect. Where we have a long TE, as I drag this slider down here, you can see that there's a great difference between these two tissues. These lines represent tissues. So we have the tissue here represented by the blue line and the tissue here represented by the red line. So if I use a later TE, you can see the differentiation uh, of the signal differences between these two tissues. Now, whenever you look at these graphs, the vertical axis of the graph, in this case, it's a T2 curve. You can see MXY, which is the magnetization in the transverse plane. This is the amount of signal that is, that is still in the transverse plane that each tissue is causing. And then the horizontal line of the graph is the timeline on any of these that we're gonna see here. So the longer the TE, as we saw, the greater the T2 effect. Right here at a short TE, there isn't much differentiation between these two tissues. But down here as a long TE, you can see that there is a big difference between the signal intensity of the blue tissue versus the signal intensity of the red tissue. Now this is a T1 recovery curve, and we can tell that by the ascending 
occurs versus the descending that we saw. Now the vertical axis of the graph here represents MZ, which is the longitudinal magnetization or the magnetization that is aligned with the magnetic field. So our two tissues here, red and blue, now we're labeling them A and B, have two different recovery curves. So the, the tissue in red here is recovering very quickly, where the tissue in blue is taking a little bit longer to recover. So at a short TR here, there's a great amount of difference between the signal intensity of tissue A versus the signal intensity of tissue B. But as you can see down here at a long TR, there's very little difference. So looking at this in um, uh, Cartesian coordinate system, the short TR gives us a pretty well-defined signal because there's so much more signal intensity in the transverse plane here from the red tissue versus the blue. And on the long TR, you can see that the blue, there's very little uh, signal difference here because the blue tissue now has caught up with the red and its recovery curve. So a short TR gives a strong T1 effect. So the shorter the TR, the greater the T1 effect, again, as we saw. So here's short TR, as you can see, as I drag this slider down the timeline, you have a, a great difference in signal intensity between these two tissues, but a long TR kind of erases that T1 effect, as you see here. So many of us have seen these types of tables before. So we know the combinations of TR and TE, which create our contrast weighting. So if we have a short TR with a short TE, of course, that's going to give us T1 weighting. And there's ranges of, of short and long too, as we, as we know. If we have a short, uh, excuse me, a long TE with a long TR, that's going to give us our T2 weighting. But if we combine a long TR with a short TE, of course, that gives us proton density weighting, which is kind of our third type of, of most common tissue weighting that we do in MR. The short TR with the long T is, is, uh, is not feasible, really. It's not done because the, the, uh, the short TR um, would not give enough signal recovery for the long TE for the long dephasing, and so you really wouldn't get any signal, and so they're, therefore they're not done. So to get T1, we obtain uh, both sh a short TR, which we saw, and a short TE. So the, the short TR increases the T1 effect, and the short TE decreases the T2 effect. It kind of wipes out that T2 effect. So here's the short TR. So this was going to be kind of a double graph where you see the longitudinal relaxation of these two tissues again. And now we're going to, if I click it again, we're going to see what the tissues are going to do in the transverse plane. And then, if, like I said, if the TE is short here, again, by the time we tell the system to take the image, the differentiation between these two tissues is very great. Of course, the tissue in red here is going to be very bright, where the tissue here in blue is going to be darker or hypo-intense, as we say. Doing that for T2 weighting now, combination with a long TR, which decreases the T1 effect and a long TE, which actually increases the T2 effect. So we, we put our recovery curves in motion here. So there's a long TR. And now if I click it again, we'll see in the transverse plane, the MXY signal and see our TE time we, we selected was way long out here. And now there's a big differentiation now between these two tissues, but in reverse, you can see the signal intensity of the blue tissue is much higher than the signal intensity of the red tissue. So that is a very high T2 effect. For proton density, um, long TR, short TE, again, it's not T1, it's not T2. Its signal relies on the density of protons or simply the concentration of hydrogen. Uh, we know PD weighting is used for musculoskeletal imaging uh, with fat saturation, especially. Um, TR times of, of around 2,000 to 4,000 milliseconds and TEs of 25 to 40 milliseconds is, is a, a basic proton density sequence. 
Here's a table of T1 relaxation times. As you can see, fat here has the shortest T1 relaxation time, and this is at 1.5 Tesla, I might add, so about 180 milliseconds uh, for fat to recover 63% uh, of its longitudinal magnetization, and you can see the other tissues are listed here. CSF, which is mostly water, of course, has the longest T1 relaxation time at about 2,000 milliseconds, which if we convert that to seconds, that's two full seconds that it takes CSF to recover longitudinally. So I mentioned 63%. So T1 relaxation time is actually defined as when the tissue's magnetization has recovered longitudinally 63% of its initial value. And so at 63%, it's about two thirds of the recovery curve of the total recovery, we call that T1 relaxation time. So comparing these two tissues again, red and blue or A and B, you can see the recovery curve for the red tissue when it crosses the 63% line here and we drop down to the timeline has a very short T1 relaxation time. However, the blue tissue and its curve, when it finally crosses 63% recovery and down here, it has obviously a longer T1 relaxation time. So when the signal is red, once again, there's a differentiation there. So the tissue B is actually less than tissue A in signal. Now this is a table of T2 contrast relaxation times, or T2 relaxation times. T2 is independent of field strength because it's happening in the transverse plane, which is away from our magnetic field. So it's where the signal is received. Transverse plane, as I mentioned, is where we put our receiver coils. So it is the signal that is precessing through the receiver coils, called, it's causing electricity in those coils, and we call that signal. So you can see by the relaxation times here that these relaxation times are typically much shorter, or actually much shorter than the T1 relaxation times. So as I mentioned earlier as well, T2 happens first. The signal begins to dephase in the transverse plane before it is uh, able to recover longitudinally. Interestingly, fat does not have the shortest T2 relaxation. It's, it shows muscle here, um, and then fat at 90 milliseconds. CSF, however, still has the longest T2 relaxation time at about 300 milliseconds, again, mostly water. So let's look at a T2 curve. And so T2 is defined as when the tissue's magnetization has lost 63% of its value in the transverse plane and 37% of that value still remains. That is what is referred to as that tissue's T2 relaxation time. So in T2 weighting, the tissue that has the short T2 will be bright or hypo, uh, excuse me, a dark hypo signal or hypo intense meaning dark. Hyper, of course, bright, hypo, dark. So again, when the red tissue A here decreases to 37 or 63% and 37% of it remains on the transverse plane, we call that one T2 time for that particular tissue. And when the blue tissue has 37% of its original value still left, um, we drop down to the timeline, you can see it has a longer T2 relaxation time. And then once again, when the signal is red in the transverse plane, tissue A is, is hypo-intense or less or darker than tissue B. So, so some examples of contrast weighting. Um, again, a T1 curve here. Uh, we see that fat, of course, has the shortest uh, T1 relaxation time in the body. So you can see that's the, the green tissue or the green curve here that represented by uh, this, this curve. And then white matter here in the internal capsule you can see has kind of an inter intermediate relaxation time. And of course, CSF now in red has the longest T1 relaxation time. For T2 relaxation, we have just two. There are no circles on here, but use the CSF in the lateral ventricles. Um, it has a, is hyper intense to the white matter. You can see the white matter here in the internal capsule and some of the subcortical white matter has gone uh, uh, darker 
than uh, the gray matter and obviously darker than CSF. And so this curve shows us that CSF is brighter. On this example, this is a, an MRCP, the abdomen, biliary tree, gallbladder, and bile ducts. Uh, it's have very heavily T2 weighted. Um, as we know, the TE on these is very high, sometimes eight, nine hundred milliseconds, even a thousand milliseconds at 1.5. So nearly all of the other tissues get saturated or suppressed except water, of course, which has a much higher T2 relaxation time. So that's what this is showing here. All the other tissues have, have decayed to zero. Their signal is decayed, but the water is still stationary. Water is still very bright, and we're able to see water in the gallbladder uh, or bile, uh, in the biliary tree, pancreatic duct, and, of course, this is loops of bowel and a little bit of fluid in the stomach. Sequences are used that are used for this are... Uh, single shot fast spin echo on a GE system or haste on a Siemens system. They are used and done in 2D as well as 3D. Uh, so very fast pulse sequences, as we know. So the impact of TR on signal, a very short TR will not give enough signal. It doesn't allow for enough longitudinal magnetization recovery. Only a couple of tissues recover as we've seen, or maybe one if it's very short and that's fat. So uh, again, we see this recovery curve with the TR that's too short. When the signal is red, there's no, there's really only 5% signal from both of these tissues. If the TR is too long down here, now the tissue has, signal has pretty much decayed. And again, there's, uh, there's, there's good signal here um, if we were to take that uh, image in this area. But here, just depending on what the TE is, of course, because this won't show on T2 what, uh, what we're actually asking for TE. So long TEs will um, result in lower signal to noise and short TRs will also result in lower signal to noise. As I mentioned here, the longer the TE, the weaker the signal because of the decay of transverse magnetization. So now in the transverse plane, these tissues are decaying and they're, and they're eventually going to zero where they completely, both tissues have completely dephased. And so if the T, TE is too long, once again, both tissues have dephased. So there's no more signal left in the receiver coil. And if it's short, got a lot of signal, but again, no differentiation between those. So once again, for TE, short TEs give us higher signal to noise ratio, longer TEs give us lower signal to noise ratio. So this becomes important when we're trying to optimize our parameters, um, say a 100 millisecond TE on a T2 will give us higher signal to noise ratio than 150 milliseconds, things like that we have need to think about. Let's move to the next sequence and look at some pulse sequences. We'll look at the two most common pulse sequences that we do, spin echo and fast spin echo, two of the most common that we do. We'll look at, describe and identify the spin echo from a pulse sequence diagram, also known as a chronogram. List the characteristics and uses of spin echo and advantages. We'll look at fast spin echo, define it, how that affects what we do, and the effects that F FSE or fast spin echo has on SAR, which is our specific absorption rate or amount of RF energy deposited into tissue, as well as our signal to noise ratio. And then we'll look at echo train length slash turbo factor. So you're looking at a what's called a chronogram. Some people call this a pulse sequence diagram or PSD. Some others call it just a simple line diagram. So when you see these, there are typically five lines of data here, uh, each representing a different portion of the system and the signal coming from the patient. So we have the top line here is the RF line. So it's what the uh, system is sending to the slice of tissues. So the RF pulses. The second line is the slice, which tells the RF which slice of tissue to excite. 
we have the phase encoding gradient here that phase encodes each signal and, and assigns it to K space, to a line of K space. And then we have the frequency encoding gradient here, which actually records the echo. And it's the number of da data points on each line of K space. And then the very bottom line here is the actual signal that it's coming from the patient's tissues. As you can see here, the, the, this 180 is the rephasing pulse or refocusing pulse, which um, allows true T2 decay. As you can see that um, at, with the 90 degree excitation pulse, we get what's called T2 star decay. So it's a very fast decay due to in homogeneities or unevenness of the magnetic field. By rephasing it, we can actually get true T2 decay. The difference between T2 and T2 star decay is something that's called T2 prime, which we won't really get into in this talk. Let's just look at a couple of examples of, of some spin echo imaging T1s. Uh, this is a shoulder. We can kind of tell it's T1 for the bright fat, both all the, with the subcutaneous fat bright, the intramuscular fat is bright, as well as the bone marrow fat is bright. Um, the cortical bone on all of these is typically is black if it's normal, um, because cortical bone contains very little movable hydrogen. It's mostly calcium. So the bone cortex is always going to be black. On most sequences, there are some modern systems and applications that actually turn this cortical bone bright white now in what's called zero TE imaging. And it almost looks like a CT scan or an X-ray. But for the majority of our imaging, cortical bone is black. Bone marrow is bright on T1. Muscle is an intermediate gray. And tendons, ligaments, cartilage is typically dark when they are, are normal. This is a, a T1 of the brain, of course, bright fat around the skull, um, as, and then dark CSF. Um, this, this short TR uh, allows fat to be bright, and uh, the short TE nullifies the signal from CSF. You can see the gray matter, white matter differentiation where White matter is actually now a little hyper intense, so it's a little brighter than the gray matter that you see here, because white matter contains a phospholipid called myelin, which is an insulator for the axons in the white matter. So it's 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 a fatty substance that uh, follows the pattern of of higher signal intensity on T1. This is an image of the thumb. As I mentioned, tendons when they're healthy and normal should be nice and black on all pulse sequences. You can see again, the cortical bone here in the uh, metacarpal here is, is nice and black as well. Then the bone marrow is bright. And that tells us this is T1 waiting. Same thing in the uh, short axis plane here. You can see the bright, uh, bright fat in the bone marrow as well as subcutaneously and the, and the dark uh, signal void or no signal from the tendons. So let's look at uh, fast spin echo now and the pulse sequence diagram or chronogram for FSC, fast spin echo or turbo spin echo. Um, the fast spin echo adds a train of 180 uh, degree rephasing pulses after the 90 excitation. And the reason for that is it creates a, a train of, of signal echoes. Each one is used to fill a separate line of K space and we therefore can fill K space much faster. Just a reminder on K space, every image has its own K space. So if you're prescribing 20 images through say a brain, each image has its own K space. So the system will assign 20 K spaces in the array processor to process the data from each slice. So if we can fill the K space for each image much quicker by multiple echoes in each TR, that's, that's gonna be an advantage to us as we know. So this is just has, has an echo train of three, you know, you see the three 180s here, and then the sequence starts over again with the excitation pulse. Each echo gets phase encoded to a different line of K-space, and each signal received is digitized, and date, their data points are put on the line of K-space. So as I drag this, you can see how in one TR period, we fill three lines of K-space rather than, than just one, as we do in a conventional spin echo. That makes the scan time. Uh, three times less. So some important parameters in fast spin echo or turbo spin echo 
The first term is the the effective TE. That's the that's the TE that we desire that we want in our protocol. Um, we ask for a TE in a particular uh, sequence, and in a fast spin echo, the system assigns that TE uh, to a particular line of case space in the center of case spaces we're going to see coming up, and that is uh, the TE that we desire to for the images to be weighted by. Um, it's not always exactly what we ask for. We might ask for a 90 TE and the system, depending on the echo spacing, which we'll talk about, the bandwidth, the frequency matrix, will calculate as close as we can. Sometimes you'll see it as 87, sometimes 92, but it tries to get as close as possible to the TE that we're asking for. Now, a really important parameter in MR imaging that, that people don't realize how important it is, is your minimum TE which equals your echo spacing. So the closer these echoes are together, the less blurring, and we'll see that coming up later in the talk about blurring. Um, but the, your minimum TE, let's say in this case, just for uh, demonstration purposes is, is 10 milliseconds. So the first TE is done at 10 milliseconds. And then every TE after that is spaced at 10 milliseconds. That's how our echo spacing is. So this would be 10 milliseconds, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 milliseconds would be our TE max here, which would be our last TE in the echo train. All right, so echo spacing is, is important um, as far as, as uh, image quality goes, as we'll see coming up. Now you see an echo train here of 20. Um, and so this is a 20 echo train and we, we're gonna experiment with a couple of different uh, ways of filling case space. Uh, let's say we want our effective TE to be around 20 milliseconds. So long TR, it needs a long TR to be able to get 20 echo trains within that TR period. And then we'll be doing a short TE of 20 milliseconds. So as we know from previous slides, that would be a proton density weighted image. So the system will order the phase encodings to put that 20 millisecond TE that we desire, our effective TE, in the center of case space because that is where the image contrast is uh, recorded in case space. And of course, this this grid represents case space. And I can, like I said, each image has its own case space. So it orders the phase encodings to put our effective TE in the center, which controls the image contrast. And the, the echoes that are far from what we're asking for are ordered in the periphery of K-space to help fill K-space to complete the image as well as help with the image resolution, but trying to stay as far as possible from the center to not to try to affect the contrast of the image, even though collectively it still does affect, but the system tries to get it as far away as possible, these later echoes, to try to maximize the value from the 20 TE that we desire, our effective TE. Let's say we wanted 100 TE as our effective TE. We're doing a T2, so long TR, 100 TE is also long. Now the system's gonna order the phase encodings where the 100 TE is in the center of K space. And then the echoes far from that, the 10 and the 200, let's say, are put in the periphery, again, to help fill K space, to give the image resolution but to try not to affect the contrast as much as possible. So that's just the way the system does that on fast spin echo. Let's look at some examples of T2s. Lumbar spine image, T2, bright CSF. Bone marrow fat is pretty dark on this one. There's a sat band here. That's why you see this black area of signal void. You can still see the little bit of the abdomen anterior here. Um, so bone marrow fat in the vertebral bodies as well as the spinous processes here uh, is dark. You can see the discs against the bright CSF. You can see the cord coming down here. Uh, the fat in the subcutaneous area is a little brighter than we would expect it. And that's, that happens in fast spin echo because of all the echo trains. It's a phenomenon called J coupling, which uh, keeps that fat brighter than we would expect it to be or brighter than it would have been on a conventional spin echo so we we uh when when fast spin echo first came out radiologists said well the fat's too bright so then they had to create some fat saturation techniques 
And that's, that's where those came from. And we'll see one coming up here. Obviously a brain here, T2 weighted, um, brightest thing on the image is the CSF and the ventricles, third ventricle here, lateral tail of the lateral ventricles here, uh, Sylvian fissures here. You can see that the white matter is, is dark, hypo intense to the gray matter. Uh, because, well, again, white, white matter has a pretty good amount of fat in it. And then the fat around the skull here is still a little bit bright, again, because of, of J coupling. This is a wrist, uh, T2 with some fat saturation. You can see the bone marrow fat. Uh, and the, even though it's not a dark fat side, you can, you can kind of tell that the fat has been suppressed. You can see it down here in the fingers, which helps to see the uh, fluid from, or the signal from fluid in the synovial fluid or any pathology that we may see. All right, let's get to the image quality part. We'll look at contrast, signal to noise, spatial resolution, scan time, and we'll put those on a continuum to be able to kind of see how they affect each other. So we'll look at the parameters used uh, in MR, how they relate to image quality, the, the computer controls that affect image quality, the pulse sequences with their associated image contrast. Again, we'll, we'll define signal to noise ratio and we'll look at, at uh, noise on the, on the image. So again, you can see examples here of three images that are T2 weighted. On the far left, there's an axial T2 fast spin echo, typical, just kind of like the one we saw, bright CSF. You can see the, the globes of the eyes here are bright with the, the, the vitreous is bright, uh, the aqueous as well. Uh, here's a bright fat around the side or the edges of the skull from the J coupling. And then uh, if we move over to the far right, you can see a coronal T2. This has fat saturation on, as I mentioned. So you can see that that fat is now saturated dark down in the face and around the skull here. Um, so that, that gets rid of the fat signal. And the one in the middle is an axial DWI trace with a B value of 1000. And a lot of times we don't, we don't think of that as a T2, but it, when we do diffusion weighting, you get a B0 image which is basically just an EPI T2. It's not shown here. And then the, the trace image is made from the B1000 for the ADC map. Then the system takes that B0 and that B1000 and calculates the difference and sort of inverts the contrast for uh, looking at different pathologies. T1 contrast, coronal knee. Typical bright fat, bone marrow, and subcutaneous, in the shoulder here, and in the foot. So signal to noise ratio is the ratio of the MR signal that is received by the coil in relationship to the noise in the background. And noise is constant. Noise doesn't increase or decrease. It's a, it's a constant in the background, noise is created uh, by any electronic device. Even the tissues of the body produce a certain amount of noise as well. So in this image here, we have a pretty good signal to noise ratio. So we have high signal and the signal really um, blocks our view of the noise, I guess you could say. As I decrease the signal intensity, you're gonna see the noise show up. It's there in the background. Uh, and of course, that's a very noisy image. So, uh, so MRI works very much like uh, radio, like broadcast radio, AM and FM radio. So if, if you're looking for a station and you're looking through the dial and you don't have a lot of signal, you're going to hear a lot of static, and that's noise. When you find the signal of the radio station and you get on its center frequency, now that signal is, is very, very strong and you hear the, the radio station very uh, clearly, and you don't hear the noise. So in radio, we, we hear the static. In MRI, we see the static if we don't have enough signal. Uh, the other part of image quality is, is our resolution, our spatial resolution, our ability to see detail. Um, it's controlled by the size of the voxels that we scan with. And we'll look at voxels coming up here. But before we look at voxels, we look at pixels. Pixels are two-dimensional and voxels are three-dimensional. 
Um, this image here, and this is for demonstration purposes, as I uh, decrease the matrix, you can see 512, 48 squared, 384, 256, 192. Going down to 96, you can see that image is quite blocky now because at 96 by 96, uh, the, the pixels are so large that you really are, are losing the resolution there. Um, as I go back up again, as you can see, we get a nice sharp image. And again, this is just for demonstration purposes, but you get the idea. Large pixels will decrease our resolution. However, as we'll see, large pixels also increase our signal to noise. So again, it's a balance. Field of view is the other parameter that controls spatial resolution because it controls the size of the pixels and voxels. Um, again, this, this brain image here, um, if I was to scan a brain at 48 centimeters, which would be kind of silly, 48 centimeter field of view, and then try to zoom in, you can see we got that, Hello. you know, I want to that real blocky appearance. Again, as I go uh, up, uh, excuse me, if I go down in field of view and, and zoom it up, you can see, again, it's still a little bit blocky. Um, 24 is, which is our typical field of view for brain, 20 to 24. 16, if we're doing orbits or IACs, often you don't, we don't often do 12 centimeters. But again, this is for demonstration purposes. So the, the smaller the field of view, the smaller the pixels and voxels in each direction in the matrix, and therefore increases the, the resolution. We can actually calculate pixel size by dividing the field of view in millimeters by the matrix in each direction. So that's why resolution is a geometric parameter is how I like to refer to it, because it, it, the, uh, it can be calculated as if you're scanning, you can see it on your system as voxel size in millimeters. So we can actually calculate that geometry by dividing the field of view by the matrix in each direction. And then when we add the voxel size, which is the slice thickness or the depth of the pixels, that's the depth of the voxel, we, we add a third dimension. So this is the slice thickness, just a little demonstration here, thoracic spine. If we were to scan it at 10 millimeters thick, and you can see how blurry that gets because of partial volume averaging. If I go down in thickness, it gets a little sharper, typically three to four centimeters, five centimeters for uh, most times. But again, demonstration purposes at one millimeter, you see how sharp that is. But you obviously practically would not scan a, a thoracic spine at one millimeter 2D. Maybe 3D, you could do something like that, but not at 2D. So here's a demonstration of a voxel. So it's just a cube. It's a three-dimensional cube. Um, as my field of view decreases, so does the size of the pixels. The pixel, this is the face of the pixel right here. And you can see that in millimeters. So again, this is our geometry. And then this is the depth of the voxel here because the slice thickness controls the depth. So if I'm at 10 millimeter field of view, um, I'm going to increase my matrix. You can see the pixels and voxel sizes are getting smaller, both mathematically and visually here. And then it's still a very thick slice because I'm at 10 millimeter slice thickness, so I really need to reduce that as well. Now I'm at uh, half, half millimeter slice thickness. So, um, so large, large voxels give us lots of signal but they also give us very low resolution. Where on the other side, small voxels give us very high resolution, but we lose signal to noise and we have to make up for it, obviously in certain ways. Scan time is the third component of image quality. Um, it's defined as the total time it takes to complete the entire acquisition or the time it takes to fill all the case space for each slice in the acquisition and varies, as we know, by pulse sequence. Here are some basic equations. Uh, the scan time for a conventional spin echo is TR times next times the phase matrix. If it's a fast spin echo, it's still TR times next times phase. However, it's divided by the echo train length because remember we're filling multiple lines of case space per TR, so that cuts the scan time down mathematically. 
A 2D gradient echo is the same as the spin echo. A 3D gradient echo, let's say, is the TR times next times phase times the number of slices in the volume. Some systems call it locs per slab or locations per slab. Some systems call it partition. So scan time all, must always be balanced with SNR and spatial resolution. So therefore, it is a factor of image quality. We want to always produce the highest quality images in the shortest amount of time. Uh, it doesn't do us any good to produce high quality images if it takes forever. And again, on the other side, it doesn't do us any good to go super fast if the images that we turn in are, are suboptimal. So we can put those three factors of image quality on a triangular continuum. As we increase spatial resolution, these two are going to, you're going to see are inversely proportional, right? As spatial resolution, our detail increases by smaller fields of view, smaller matrix or higher matrix numbers give us smaller pixels, thinner slices. Our other side here, our SNR, which controls our image contrast, and you can see uh, contrast to noise ratio, which is signal to noise ratio's cousin here, um, also decreases. So as resolution increases, SNR decreases. And so we have to make up for it sometimes. So if we want to increase or get our signal to noise back, typically we have to increase our scan time to do that. And there are ways of doing that. Um, every sequence that we run, whether you realize it or not, falls somewhere in this triangular continuum. Sometimes it's geared more towards resolution. Sometimes signal is, is really what we're interested in. Sometimes we need to go very fast. So everything that we prescribe falls within this continuum. Now, modern systems using art artificial intelligence now enable very high resolution imaging while maintaining SNR with extremely short scan times as the deep learning algorithm eliminates the noise. So with AI, there's the, the AI program strips out the noise and no longer we have a signal to noise ratio, we just have signal. So it's, it's, a, it's really been a, a very exciting development in MRI to have artificial intelligence and deep learning in, in the reconstruction of images. We'll get into the last part here, the multi-slice acquisition, look at another chronogram. We'll look at uh, max TE again, uh, that blurring artifact I mentioned. We'll look at a couple of artifacts like chemical shift, how bandwidth affects chemical shift, uh, receive bandwidth, and then we'll summarize. Once we summarize, we'll have um, a, a, a poll of questions that you can, that you'll be able to answer. Also, um, before we get to the poll, we're going to look at, at the simulator and, and try some of these things on the MR simulator that one will show you. So a little bit more to do. So we'll compute uh, in this sequence acquisition times and understand the concept of a multi-slice acquisition. So again, by increasing the TR or decreasing the maximum TE by either shorter echo spacing or less echoes, we obtain more slices in a single acquisition or more slices per TR. Uh, as we see here, uh, as the TE max decreases, uh, we're uh, not able to do as many slices. Same thing as that the TR decreases, uh, we can't do as many slices. So remember we, we do multi-slice acquisition by um, it's telling the system to excite the uh, case space of of slice one, two, three, four, and through on to the uh, for the entire acquisition before it has to um, before the TR period is over and it has to come back and ex excite the second line of case space for all of those slices. So we're using the TR time for the system to be able to excite additional slices in our acquisition uh, rather than, of course, one line at a time, which would not be practical, or one slice at a time, I should say, which would not be practical. We've seen this before. The maximum TE is calculated by the minimum TE, which again is our echo spacing. Min TE equals echo spacing. Um, multiplied by the echo train length, as we saw earlier, this TE max is at 80 if we assume that this is a 10 millisecond min TE, just for uh, ease of, of calculating. So 10, again, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 milliseconds. So that's our max TE. Um, 
to get the best contrast and the least amount of blurring, we always want our effective TE, which again is our selected TE, the one that we would like the sequence to be weighted by, um, by the uh, in the middle of the echo train, and I'll and show you how to do that here. If we don't do that, first of all, this is what we get is blurring artifact where the borders are blurred. Um, this is not motion artifact. It's not poor spatial resolution. It's simply blurring because using too long of an echo train or not balancing our effective TE within the echo train gives us this artifact. So it's important to do, especially on T2s to do what we, what I like to call TE balancing. So in an optimal setting, the max TE here should be approximately double your selected or effective TE plus the minimum. So here's a little equation you may want to remember is that if you're calculating, it, it, say you have an effective TE of 100 you want. So you multiply that times two, and let's say our echo spacing is still 10 milliseconds. So 100 times two is 200 plus your min TE, which is 10 milliseconds, that's 210 milliseconds. So your max TE should be 210 milliseconds. So you adjust that, that's adjusted by receive bandwidth. As receive bandwidth increases, your minimum TE and maximum TE decrease. And then your maximum TE alone is controlled by your, your echo train length. Obviously, the less echo trains, the lower your max TE. So when you're trying to decide and balance your TE, you say, okay, I want 100 millisecond TE is my effective. My minimum is at 10 milliseconds. So my max TE should be 210. Now I know my 100 milliseconds is balanced right in the middle of this echo train mathematically for the best contrast and the least amount of blurring to eliminate that blurring artifact and give you the best contrast. That's called TE or T2 balancing. It's not just limited to T2, it can also be done on uh, proton density. T1 doesn't do much for us because we've only got an echo train of, say, two to four. Um, so it, it really benefits T2s and even longer, P, longer uh, TE uh, proton density images. Here's an example, um, an echo train of 37. You can see the, the blurring artifact that we're getting here, which is non-optimized. And now with an with an ETL that's a little uh, a little more common, a little more um, standard, you can see that that blurring artifact has decreased quite a bit. Next artifact we'll look at is chemical shift artifact. Um, it's an artifact caused by the um, fat and water being uh, precessing at different frequencies as molecules. Um, and so it, it's visualized by a strip of, of bright signal intensity on one side of a fat water interface. And typically we'll see this in the abdomen and the kidneys because the kidneys are all full of water sitting in the retroperitoneal fat of the abdomen. And so you have this fat water interface. And so bright signal on one side of the organ and a dark signal void on the other side of the organ, as you can see here and here. And that's just because fat and water uh, precess at different frequencies or their molecular tumbling rate is at different frequencies. And therefore, when it's mapped into K-space, the signals separate, as we'll see here. So the, the fat and water don't have the same rotational speed. That's precessional frequency or tumbling molecular tumbling rate because of their molecular composition. Fat has is a very large molecule where water is a very small molecule. And so the precessional difference um, splits and this increases with increasing field strength. It's pretty negligible at low field strength, but at 1.5, 3T and even more, it starts to become a factor. What happens is, like I said, the, uh, the, the signals from fat and water shift and now you have what would be the real volume here in this diagram. Uh, water plus fat gives us this bright signal intensity water only, and then the signals cancel each other here, and that's why you have this signal void. So what do we do about that? 
Well, we increased our received bandwidth. We assigned more hertz per pixel so that the mathematical difference between the intensities of fat and water uh, are less, so they cover uh, less pixels. If there are more hertz per pixel, then the if the artifact covers seven pixels um, with a certain bandwidth, if we increase that bandwidth, maybe it only covers four pixels or five pixels. And, and so then also if we increase our frequency matrix, that seven pixel artifact is going to be smaller because the pixels are going to be smaller. So there are certain ways of doing that, but typically increasing the received bandwidth is the way to uh, reduce chemical shift artifact. Some systems um, report bandwidth, receive bandwidth in a plus minus. Some do total kilohertz. Some manufacturers choose hertz per pixel here. So it just have, depends on what system that you're on. So receive bandwidth is, is the signal that is being received. The, the, the uh, bandwidth is the uh, what is recorded, what is sampled by the system. So uh, you see here in the center, your signal, this is the center frequency of the signal and the, always in the center of the bandwidth. So this is a very narrow bandwidth it's for diagram. Again, it says eight kilohertz and you can see the noise kind of in the background here. Again, noise is a constant in the background from electronic devices and, and the tissues themselves. So we're sampling the signal and a certain amount of noise, but if I increase the received bandwidth, now I'm, I tell the system not only to sample the signal, but sample a wider range and it's sampling noise. So there are drawbacks and there are advantages to this. The, the, the drawback or the disadvantage is the signal to noise ratio decreases because now I'm sampling, telling the system to sample more noise. However, the sampling rate is much faster because we know that at high bandwidths, things happen much quicker. So it can sample quicker. You can do more slices per TR. There's some other advantages to that, especially when you get into the um, into AI deep learning and trying to set up protocols for that. Um, but also, as I mentioned, increasing the received bandwidth allows more hertz per pixel and so reduces your chemical shift artifact. So once again, you'll have to find the right balance and it depends on a lot of factors. So in summary, this is a table of just kind of what we've been talking about. I don't know if I'll click on all these because we need to get to our other things here. This is a TR. So the TR increases, the T1 effect decreases. T2 effect is, is um, not affected because remember TE controls TR, uh, excuse me, TE controls T2. Uh, signal to noise goes up as TR goes up. Resolution is unaffected. Blurring is unaffected. Um, so you can see as I click on these, acquisition time goes up as, as uh, TR goes up. This is bandwidth, receive bandwidth. We don't control the transmit bandwidth that's controlled by the system. And you can see how those all play out. So I'm going to switch to the simulator here. Right after we summarize this, the TR affects the T1 in the image and the SNR. Uh, the phase matrix affects the spatial resolution and therefore SNR as well as the scan time as we saw. The, the frequency matrix affects the spatial resolution. When it decreases, the resolution decreases. Slice thickness affects the SNR and the spatial resolution. And then the field of view affects the spatial resolution, the SNR, and the min TE to a certain extent. 